Hi everyone. Uh, nice to see you all here to our very last lecture of the lecture series. Before introducing today's speaker, I would like to address some smaller organi uh, organizational issues. So first, uh, we received the um, evaluation uh, thingy back. So you filled out the evaluation online and we got your feedback. So I would like to say some words on that. Uh, so most of you evaluated really, really positive. So it was really nice of you uh, to get so, so many good feedback and to see that so many people valued the lecture series and like to come here and it's also very good that we can with this show the institute and the faculty how important and valued feminist philosophy is. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, there were also some more or less negative points. Uh, so first, uh, a lot of you complained about the room, which is totally understandable. So we are uh, on that with you um, and hope that we can get a, a better room for our next events. The second is that uh, some of you found the relation between the talks uh, not so clear um, and said that it might be helpful to have like a better um, time uh, timing kind of of the talk so that they relate better to each other. Um, thank you very much for that. We will keep that in mind when organizing the next um, events. Also for some, uh, some of the talks were a bit too difficult or demanding. Um, so we hope that this would be better if there is like a more clear relation between the talks and um, we'll definitely try to make our events more accessible also to people who are not yet so informed in the field. So thank you very much for those um, points. Um, because talking about uh, further events and also uh, some of you already asked us whether there will be another lecture series in the next semester. Unfortunately, due to time uh, issues, there will not be a further lecture series but we are planning to do one or even two conferences in the next semester. So stay updated on that um, on Facebook or um, Moodle or our website. So we will definitely post it um, if we are finished with the plannings. Uh, then another organizational issue is the Modulbogen thing. So that you want to get your credits for the lecture series. Um, if you want to get them signed, you can come to us after this talk and we can sign them. Uh, it will be Jacob, Nick and I, if that helps you. Um, here Nick is waving, Jacob's not here today. Uh, so just come to us and we can sign um, the Modulbogen. If you don't have your Modulbogen with you today or if you know someone who can't come today and so on, um, then we um, can sign them next Friday or the next Friday, so not this week, but uh, from the week after, from 10 to 12. So we wrote that um, on the board as well. Uh, we will be sitting in the PC pool um, in the, like, the room next to this. Um, so we will uh, be there and um, sign um, your Modulbogen or if you can't come there uh, at this time you can also contact us via Facebook or via email and then we can make a, um, an additional meeting um, and sign your uh, Modulbogen. Um, yeah, so for today's talk uh, there is a handout which is here so if uh, anyone needs that handout just come here and uh, on this, this table um, you can find it. So now, finally, um, let me introduce you to Asta, who is our speaker today. Uh, we are very um, happy to welcome her from um, Reykjavik, where she has been before coming here, where apparently it's uh, raining a lot. Uh, so it's nice to have uh, some sun for her now here in Berlin. Um, Asta is an associate professor at the San, Fran San Francisco State University and she mainly 
uh, works on topics of uh, metaphysics, social philosophy and feminist theories. Um, her works are written um, on essence and modality, sex and gender, social construction, realism and anti-realism and um, naturalism. And just recently um, she published a monograph with Oxford University Press um, which is called Categories We Live By, which is on metaphysics of social categories. And um, this is also what she will talk about today and also what we will discuss tomorrow in the workshop, which again will take place from 12 to 2 uh, at Dorotheenstraße 24. Uh, there we will read uh, a chapter from this new book that you can find um, online on Moodle. Um, yeah, welcome Asta, thank you for being here. Thank you Lou and thank you all the organizers for this uh, allowing me to be part of this lecture series. And thank you all for, for being here and coming. I'm going to get myself ready with the technology. Everyone has a hand up. <clears throat> so as Lou said, I recently completed a book on the metaphysics of social categories and I don't have yet a copy in my hands but I hear it's out and so what I want to do today is to tell you about the project of the book, the main components in the approach I take and then zero in on a potential problem for the sort of approach I take and of course show you how I attempt to deal with it. In Infinite City, a San Francisco atlas, the author Rebecca Solnit and performance artist Guillermo Gomez Peña reflect on their experience as they travel through the city of San Francisco. Solnit finds herself as Western in Chinatown, as white in Bayview, as straight and female in the Castro. Gomez Peña is mistaken for a tourist from Argentina in Chinatown. At the Bollywood Cafe, he is the wrong kind of brown. In the Castro, he's an older gay man. And in the financial district, he's nobody. All of these, Western, white, etc., are examples of features that define social categories. And although the social categories vary in importance and pervasiveness, they set parameters for the encounters Sol Solnit and Gomez. Gomez Peña have with the people on their wanderings through the city. They also frame their own understanding of their experiences. But what exactly is a social category? To answer that is to give a metaphysics of social categories, a theory of the nature of social categories. My strategy is to give a metaphysics of the features that define them. For example, if the category is women, then the property is being a woman. If the category is queers, then the property is being queer, and so on. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a glimpse, glimpse of the book. So the project is to offer a metaphysics of social categories. You see this on the first part of the handout. The strategy is to give a theory of the social properties of individuals. Then the main components of the theory are a conferralist framework for properties, an account of social meaning, an account of social construction, and then accompanying is also an account of social identity. Then there's an application of the theory. I offer concrete conferralist proposals of categories such as sex, gender, race, disability, religion, and LGBTQ categories. So what I will do today is to present to you the main components of the theory and then the application of the theory to sex and gender and then zero in on the problem of passing. The th can everyone hear me and, and so back there too? Okay. So the first task is 
to give a theory of social features or properties of individuals. We all have various sorts of features or properties. Some are natural features, others are relational, others social. What is it to have a social feature and how does one get it? And what is a social feature? To answer these questions, I make use of what I call a conferralist framework that I have developed elsewhere and tweak it for the use on social properties. I say that social properties of individuals are conferred. What does that mean? To give you an intuitive idea of a conferred property, consider this moment in the Euthyphro when Socrates asks, is the action pious because it's loved by the gods? Or do the gods love the action because it's pious? In this case, at issue is the nature of the property being pious. Is it dependent on the gods' love or not? Euthyphro initially maintains that the action is pious because it's loved by the gods, although he later succumbs to Socrates' view that the action is pious independently of the gods' love. Everyone always succumbs to Socrates in the end, as you know. In fact, he thinks that initially that the gods come to love the action upon detecting that it's pious. And sorry, Socrates holds this view. Um, whereas Euthyphro thinks that the gods having certain fuzzy feelings towards the action makes it pious. While our interest in the Greek gods and their emotional lives has been replaced by interest in humans and our own creations, the modern question of the metaphysical status of the various properties that clothe our world mirrors exactly the euthyphronic question. What kind of property is the property of being a woman, being male, or being black? How independent are these properties from human attitudes and practices? The initial euthyphronic intuition is that they are not independently given, but rather dependent in some way on humans. The question is, how? And the answer I give is that they are conferred. How does a property get conferred? That depends on which property we're talking about, and the conferralist framework is an abstract schema that needs to be filled in for each property. One can use this framework to argue for a certain sort of subject dependency of any property. You can think of it as, uh, you can use it for color properties or any kind of property you think is subject dependent. I'm, however, chiefly concerned with social properties of individuals in this project. These include being of a certain gender or race and other features that define protected groups in various jurisdictions, but also any other category defined by a social property. The main idea is that we all have various features and some of these features have social significance in the context we travel. So, for instance, the, uh, one's height can have social significance in some contexts and not some other ones. The shape of one's nose can have social significance in some contexts and not other ones. <clears throat> and the features vary. Some of them are physical features, others are relational, some even themselves social. Some features only have social significance in very specific contexts, having a short pinky finger, for instance. Others matter in most contexts. Perhaps sex assignment is like that. But what is it for a feature to have social significance in a context? The answer I give is that it is for a social status to be conferred on the person taken to have the feature. The person may, in fact, not have the feature, they only need to be taken to have it. The social status consists in constraints and enablements on the individual's actions in the context. I will linger with this a little bit uh, as we go on. This is sort of a preview. I make a distinction between two sorts of categories, two sorts of contexts, and two sorts of features. Institutional features and what I call communal features. Institutional contexts are contexts governed by a set of rules or laws. For example, laws governing driving in California, or rules governing the activities of the dolphin swimming and rowing club in San Francisco. 
The entities that confer status on a person in those contexts have the requisite authority to confer the status in question. For example, in the case of getting the status of having a license to drive in California, that status is conferred by an official of the Department of Motor Vehicles upon judging the person to meet the relevant prerequisites. A person is conferred the status of member of the Dolphin Club by the president of the club upon being taken to meet the membership requirements. People have the status as long as it doesn't get revoked, although we may want to say that in cer certain contexts, institutional con uh, in the institutional status is inactive or in the background in a lot of our encounters. You can think of, for instance, um, I am licensed to drive in California. I have a driver's license. Um, and I, in Iceland, I was in Iceland in the summer and I wanted to renew my Icelandic driver's license. Um, but then they've changed the, the rules and I was told you can't get an Icelandic driver's license anymore since you have a, an American one, so you're supposed to drive on your American one. What that really means is that the fingers of the Department of Motor Vehicles in California stretches all the way up to the highlands in Iceland because I'm still subject to uh, the laws um, of the Department of Motor Vehicles because of the agreement that they had with Iceland. So as I exit my car to go to pick blueberries, I sort of managed to go out of the context where the, uh, the legal status of being able to drive plays a role. But then when I get back in my car, the fingers of, of um, California driving rules grab onto me again. So the, um, that means that the, sort of the institutional context and the laws um, are often in the background and they can get activated even, even though we're not aware of it. So the profile of an institutional property is like this. So I have put down here profile of uh, both institutional and communal properties. You specify five things. You say which property is conferred you say by who, um, by whom is the property conferred, so the person or entity or group in authority. You say what about it does the conferring, sometimes it's a, an explicit act, like you are hereby licensed to drive. Sometimes it's by recording something on a certificate. Then you specify under what conditions this happens. Uh, sometimes it's in presence of witnesses, or for instance, if you get married, there need to be some things that are, um, maybe there have to be witnesses and someone has to sign. And then, what I call a base property, the properties the author authorities are attempting to track in the conferral. So in the case of being licensed to drive, say, then they take you to be fulfilling all the prerequisites. And you may not indeed fulfill these prerequisites. You may actually have, um, you may have uh, falsified some document, but you show up with it and they take you to be um, 18 or whatever number that you're supposed to be. So um, the, pro the, the point is that you need not have the base property for the conferral, but you only need to be taken to have it. And I call the conferring of an institutional status on an individual, an act of classifying that individual. The other sort of feature is what I call a communal one. A communal feature is a social status conferred upon a person in a context on the basis of them being taken to have a feature that is socially salient in the context. And this status consists in constraints and enablements just like an in institutional context but these constraints are not deontic. They're not rights and privileges. They are what you can get away with in the context. For example, being tall may be a socially important property in a context, and people taken to be tall given power to make decisions for the other people in the context. Being short may also be socially significant property. When you're taken to be short, no one will listen to you, things like this. Um, 
The base property for the conferral of a communal property can vary as an institutional case. Consider, for example, a party where people are interested in who is and isn't married. Perhaps they're looking for someone to marry and they don't want to get entangled with people who already are. Alex is legally married, but he doesn't carry a wedding ring and acts as if he isn't married. At the party, Alex gets conferred upon him the status of eligible bachelor by the other people at the party. This is so even though he is already married to some person or even more than one person. At the party, he has the communal status of eligible bachelor and various people flirt with him because he has that status in the context. Let's suppose now that a friend of Alex, Sami, shows up at the party and is enraged that Alex is acting as if he isn't legally married. Then Sami tells some people at the party that Alex is already married. And after people whisper, Alex loses his communal status as eligible bachelor in the context. People may even feel hurt or betrayed that he had acted as if he wasn't married. The profile for a communal property is the following. You specify the, the conferred property. You can see it on the handout here. You, sp you specify the person or entity or group that is doing the work, and they have to have not authority, but what I call standing. And they confer it. Um, the conferral is, can be explicit or implicit. It could be a standing attitude. Um, and this happens in any and every context we find ourselves in. This is a context like that. If you go to a party, that's a context. Even within a, a party, you can have a little context. You co could go into the kitchen. And then there's a different social dyna dynamics from when, when if you enter into the living room. <clears throat> so in the example I mentioned, it's important to note that we have two distinct property. We have this institutional property of being legally married. And then we have this being presumed to be legally married. And then the corresponding being legally not married and being presumed to be legally not married, which I labeled an eligible bachelor. So obviously being taken to be not legally married in a contest doesn't make them not legally married, but they function in a certain way in the context. <clears throat> now, what precisely is the content of the associated norms and from where do they derive? The answer to that will vary from context to context. I think that when we enter a communal context, such as a cocktail party, we bring with us social maps from the other context we've traveled. I think of these social maps as Hegel-inspired set of assumptions about one's own place in a social encounter, as well as that of others in the encounter. Just as for Hegel, one consciousness forms a conception of itself and the other it encounters and acts as if those conceptions are valid or true, so people entering an encounter with other people bring with them sets of assumptions about their own role in that encounter and that of the others they meet. These sets of assumptions need not at all be conscious, although sometimes they are. And I think of these social relations with associated norms for behavior as sets of assumptions corresponding to a social map. These social maps have locations, which are the available roles to play in the context, and with each location come norms for behavior for the occupant and for the others. The social locations are fully intersectional in that each feature that is socially significant in the context inflects the constraints and enablements for the occupant of that location. It is, however, an empirical question what the constraints and enablements are in each context. The relationship between the constraints and enablements and the associated norms is akin to the relationship between the constitutive rules for chess and the norms for playing well. If you flout the constitutive rules, you move the piece in a way that's not allowed, you're not playing at all, right? You're forfeiting the game or you're joking or something like that. But if you just flout the norms, you're just playing badly and you're gonna lose you know, in a few moves, uh, but you're still playing chess. So that's, um, that's the relationship that I see. 
uh, the constraint that enables don't just define what it can do or not do in the context, they also set the intelligibility frame for a person's actions. Um, I think of the conferral of a status in the communal case as an act of placing people. The placing of people on a social map is not always a simple affair that happens without struggle. Often the people in the encounter bring incompatible social maps and some negotiation happens before people settle into their roles. So you, you show up in a very conservative family um, context, for instance, and you're trying to resist the role that they're trying to push you into. Um, sometimes you're able to resist and sometimes you're not quite able and you sort of, the only thing you can do is walk out. And some contexts are even too short for anyone to settle into any role. There are attempts at placing each other onto the social maps, but it's contested from start to finish and then the encounter is over. The unfortunate aspect of the metaphor of a social map is that it suggests that we apply a fixed map that remains static throughout the encounter. But a better way to think of it is such that each action move in the context changes the shared assumptions a little bit. And the social map is then a dynamic entity changing ever so slightly with each move in the context. This is a little bit sketchy, I realize. I'm trying to give you a sense of the book, and so there's, you know, dipping into that here. We can talk about some of these things in the Q&A. But we are ready to talk about social meaning. So with this sort of sketch of the, um, of the account in place, um, of what a social property of an individual is, we can answer the question, what is it for a feature of an individual to have social meaning in the context? And here you have, um, see, we don't have that here, okay. The answer is a feature of you, so you're in a context, you're in a party or something like that, in some context, a feature is socially significant in a context in which pe people taken to have the feature get conferred onto them a social status. So for instance, if having a large nose is socially significant in a context, then people taken to have a, a large nose get conferred a status upon in them in the context. They may in fact not have a large nose, they may have put something on here to appear to have a large nose or something like this. But that means, um, but it, that is for a feature to be socially significant in a context. It comes as status. The status, of course, can be negative status. Um, and it consists in these constraints and enablements. And then, now, we can also formulate a conception of social construction that's going to allow us to give an account of social categories. There has, of course, been much discussion in various disciplines in the last 30 years about social construction. And there are a lot of different things that people want to capture with that notion. And the phen phenomenon that I want to capture is when some feature of an individual takes on social significance. For instance, when exhibiting certain secondary sex characteristics constrains what roles a person can play in the home or in civic and professional life, or when exhibiting certain morphological features associated with geographical ancestry does the same. And so the account of social construction that I can then use to capture that idea is, this, is the following. A feature of an individual F, this is the feature, is socially constructed in our context just in case there's a base feature and a conferred status F such that F is a status conferred on individuals <coughs> taken to have the base feature B in the context. So the feature, the base feature is the one that has social significance, right? And, and what that means is that there's another feature that gets conferred on top, on, onto people who are taken to have the base feature. This conferred feature F consists in constraints and enablements on your behavior in the context. And that is the socially constructed feature. Now, this is a completely general theory of social properties of individuals and social categories. 
It's an original project in theory, but it's related to, in various ways to work being done by philosophers working on the social world and on individual social categories. This includes work by Haslanger and Hacking, Mullen, Searle and others. And there's also a connection to work on epistemic and discursive injustice, if you've been um, reading some of that stuff. And I think it offers tools for people in other disciplines who might want to argue for the social construction of certain categories when that is meant as a metaphysical thesis. We can talk about this in the Q&A if you would like. But now, let us turn to the application of the framework to sex and gender. This will then allow me to present the potential problem. <clears throat> so, in my proposals for how to make sense of sex and gender and their relation, I aim to capture the type of social construction involved in the well-known feminist slogan, gender is the social significance of sex. You see people like Haslinger being uh, attracted to this slogan and wanting to give an account of sex and gender in a way that uh, it does justice to that slogan. And you see many 70s feminists uh, attached to that kind of view. For such a feminist, sex is biologically given and gender is social. For me, there's a twist. In fact, there are three. Sex is not biologically given, gender is radically context dependent, and gender is not always the social significance of sex, but can be the social significance of something else. A host of recent work in biology by Anne Foster Sterling and others reveals that the biology supposedly supporting the division into two sexes is quite messy. If we look at three main ways of dividing people into sexes by functioning genitalia, by chromosomes and hormonal levels, not only do these three methods not divide people into two neat groups, female and male, but the hard cases do not line up someone may not fit neatly into one of the categories according to one method, yet do so according to the others. The three ways of dividing people up into sexes not only do not carve nature at some joint where you have female on one side and male on the other, these three methods of carving carve up different slices of nature. But carving is not only being used metaphorically in this context, even before voluntary sex change operations, newborns with ambiguous sex characteristics have been subject to the scalpel. Foster Sterling estimates that somewhere around 1.7% of people are intersex according to one or the other of the methods used. For these reasons, I want to give an account of the property of being of a certain sex as a conferred property where the aim is to track certain physical features but where the resulting property is an institutional property, in fact a legal one. So I think that the properties in question are female and male, and there are certain jurisdictions where you can be a difference, a third sex. Australia is, how is it in Germany? Is that, can it be a third sex? It just starts. It's starting, okay, yeah. Um, the authorities that do that work are legal authorities, drawing on the expert opinion of doctors and other medical personnel, and sometimes parents. Sometimes it's a nurse who does the work. Uh, is giving the testimony and it's the recording of a sex in official documents on the basis of the testimony of parents, doctors and others and the judgment of the doctors and others as to what sex role might be most fitting given the biological characteristics present. This happens at birth in the case of newborns and after surgery and hormonal treatment in the case of older individuals. Sometimes um, you don't have to go through surgery or hormonal treatment. Um, the base property, or base properties, I think the aim is to track as many sex stereotypical characteristics as possible and doctors perform surgery in cases where that might help bring the physical characteristics more in line with the stereotype of male and female. Let us now turn to gender and consider this scenario. You work as a coder in San Francisco. You go into your office where, you, where you're one of the guys, some other people make the coffee. After work, you tag along with some friends or some were at, um, at work at, to a bar. It is a very heteronormative space. 
and you are neither a guy nor a gal, you are an other. You then walk up the street to another bar where you are a butch and are expected to buy drinks for the femmes. Then you head home to your grandmother's 80th birthday party where you help out in the kitchen with the other women while the men smoke cigars on the porch. In each of these contexts, we, in each of the contexts we travel, different features of us are socially significant. That is also true of gender contexts. In some contexts, people are trying to track sex assignment or genitalia. In others, role in societal organization, presentation of the body, role in preparation of food, role in biological reproduction, role as sexual partner, and so on. In many gender contexts, there may be a persistent assumption in the background that in tracking one of the base properties, that is, sex assignment, role in biological reproduction, all of these things we mentioned, we managed to track the other phenomena as well. But even if there were many contexts where this assumption is not misguided, the presence of the many contexts where it is an erroneous assumption shows the importance of keeping these various base properties apart, not only for a better theoretical understanding, but for practical reasons. In fact, a variety of feminist and queer theoretical work and activism has been aimed at challenging this assumption. And it is for this reason that my own suggestion as to how gender is conferred makes gender be highly context dependent and the base property or properties vary with context. On this view, not only is gender deeply context dependent when it comes to historical periods and geographic locations, but the same geographic location and time period can allow for radically different contexts, as we saw in the example I mentioned. And the general schema is on the handout the conferred property is being of a particular gender G, for example, being a woman or a man. In some cases, trans is a separate one. In some cases, gender queer is a separate one. There can be many others, guy and a gal, various kinds of things. Who is doing the, the work, the subject with standing in the context? And it's the perception of the subject with standing that the people have the base property in the context. This happens in each and every context we travel. And the base property for the conferral varies. Sometimes it's role in biological reproduction, sometimes role in societal organization of various kinds, sexual role, all kinds of things. Sometimes self-identification, but it varies. Now, <clears throat> now I'm gonna get to the problem. So the worry about uh, the worry I want to um, mention and address today is this problem of passing. There are, of course, other problems with the account. There are always problems with philosophy, there are always problems. Um, but I'm going to address this one. There is a general worry about social constructionist accounts of phenomena, such as gender, that they cannot make sense of passing. And so that's why I want to address it. Why would this be a worry for social constructionists? constructionist accounts, and would my account be subject to this worry? The worry rests on the idea that to be able to make sense of the phenomenon of, of passing, for example, when a person passes for a woman or a person of a certain race and so on, that the account need make a distinction between really being a woman and merely be taken to be one. Social constructionist accounts share the feature that the epistemic partly determines the metaphysical. The details on that vary, of course. In this case, for example, to be a woman in a context just is to have the social status in the context. There is nothing more to it. How can we then make sense of the idea that someone could be passing as a woman in some context? And if we cannot make sense of passing, then we have a host of social phenomena that the account cannot explain. For example, people's hurt or outrage over the case of Rachel Dolezal, who was the president of the NWACP in Spokane, Washington, and discovered not to have African-American ancestry. Mundane everyday examples also involve the anger a person may show at realizing that someone isn't what they thought they were. There are countless examples of this. My response to this worry 
is that it isn't a precise description of what is going on to say that on the conferralist account you're a woman if you're taken to be a woman. That char characterization leaves out a key element which is the base property and its role in the conferral. So because the account has these two layers, there's the base property and then there's the status, it's not just the status. I, I have a way of making sense of, of the phenomenon of Hassan. I say that the property of being a woman gets conferred on a person in a context when that person is taken to have the base property in the context. And this is enough to make sense of passing. This is on your handout here at the bottom. A person passes as having the base property for the conferral of the status woman when they don't have the property and the knowledge of that lack would result in the revoking of the status. The person is a woman in that context, but passes as having the base feature. I cannot say, of course, that they pass as a woman in the context, so I, there's a way of talking that I cannot preserve. But I can say that they pass as having the base feature for the conferral when they don't. So while the conferralist account of being a woman is such that to be a woman just is to have a certain social status in a context and not to have a vagina or be nurturing or to identify in a certain way, nevertheless, we can make sense of phenomena such as passing. You may notice also that this theory meets the demand for an answer to the woman question in feminist theory without giving a standard substantial answer and thus avoids the pitfall, pitfalls of such answers. But let me open the floor for questions. Thank you.